Well, hello. Welcome back to Howdy Partner. It's me, AM. I'm a partner solution architect here at AWS. I'm joined uh, with one of my trusty co-hosts, Andrew Park, another partner solution architect, and a brand new friend from Rancher, Adrian. Uh, Adrian, tell us about yourself. Who are you? What, what are you here to do today? My name is Adrian Goins. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm here to do today. No, I'm Adrian Coins. I'm the Director of Community and Evangelism at Rancher Labs. Rancher makes software to make managing and deploying Kubernetes easier. I'm not a sales guy, so I'm just here to show you Kubernetes, show you Rancher, answer your questions, and hopefully we can make the next couple hours super awesome. Wait a minute. Isn't it always the sales guy who tells you that he's not the sales guy? I'm genuinely not the sales guy. I'm just somebody who, who loves... I love uh, Kubernetes. I'm only joking, only messing with you. Um, it's like when somebody says, trust me, and you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So welcome. <laughs> if, if you're new here or if you're returning, uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, this is Howdy Partner. It's a show all about our AWS partner network, right? So uh, it's, it's featuring all types of, of companies, products, solutions, that are uh, AWS partners, and they help you to build with or uh, build easier sometimes uh, with AWS services. And today we're joined with Rancher. It's uh, it's a lot of tools, actually. You all have a lot of projects, I have to say. Um, yeah. I would say the biggest probably crossover for Rancher and AWS is uh, with EKS. So if, mm -hmm. if there's anybody on stream with uh, EKS questions and uh, general Kubernetes questions, uh, today's your lucky day. We, we, we're here to answer those, and we're here to show you how to work with EKS uh, with Rancher and, and some other cool things that Rancher can do too. Maybe maybe not all AWS stuff either, but uh, but we're excited to have you, Adrian. Thanks for for joining us. Yeah, uh, Andrew, I know yes. you're. You're gonna you're gonna tell us a little bit about Kubernetes, I think, and then uh, Adrian's gonna kick us into higher gear, going deeper into Kubernetes. Is that right? Yeah, 100. percent And uh, just a quick note: um, if this is your first time tuning into the channel, make sure to subscribe uh, for clear updates because uh, we definitely have a lot of cool partners that we're working with on the show. So make sure to subscribe. Um, but yeah, so my name is Andrew Park. Uh, I'm a partner solutions architect here with AWS, and my focus is actually a lot on EKS. And so super excited about Adrian on the show. Um, and so we could probably talk about Kubernetes for many, many hours. And realistically speaking, we'd probably have to break down the show into multiple episodes just because of how deep Kubernetes goes, right? Um, but I think what's helpful to kind of frame and shape the idea of Kubernetes to someone that maybe isn't as familiar is to think about the scenario where you have hundreds and hundreds of containers that do two different things. Um, and as the administrator or even as a developer, uh, you run into the problem of, okay, I have all these containers. Uh, some containers are breaking, some containers need to scale. Uh, this container needs to talk to this container. And then you run into this problem of, okay, what do I do? How do I fix this problem, right? And so when you think about Kubernetes, you know, the textbook definition of Kubernetes is that it's basically an open source container orchestration system for being able to uh, automate the deployment of your applications, automate the scaling of your applications, and it just makes managing your containers much easier. Because the problem with not having a, an open source, or not even open source, but just a container orchestration system in place is that you kind of defeat the purpose of using containers. Because if you have hundreds of containers all just in one big block, what you've essentially done is you've created a monolith, which is not what you want to do, right? Um, and so that's kind of the problem that Kubernetes solves, that it just makes managing all of your containers much easier. And so to take it a step further, right? Uh, the basic idea of Kubernetes is to further abstract machines, storage, and networks away from their physical implementations. And so what you're essentially doing is that you're creating a layer of abstraction on top of your infrastructure to make it much easier to manage your applications, scale your applications, and also manage your applications, right? And this could be in prem, this could be in the cloud, if you want to work across multiple clouds, you know, Kubernetes gives you that flexibility, right? Yeah, and so we're already, mentioned... actually, we've already got yeah. some people in chat, uh, you know, spoilers a little bit. Uh, they're they're already talking about uh, 
K3s or K3s, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's like uh, one of the areas, right? Like, <laughs> Andrew, you, you were mentioning, right? Like, you can deploy uh, Kubernetes uh, and and then workloads onto Kubernetes on, on all kinds of different environments. And uh, K3s, yeah, is my favorite ways uh, at the edge. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's it's super cool. There's a ton of I'm sure Adrian can can uh, enlighten us here a little bit too later on. Uh, but there's a ton of of really interesting use cases for this. Uh, when Nikki and I did our show last year, uh, and we had Rancher on actually, we were talking about K3s because Nikki and I were building a fake theme park. And I think that's like <laughs> total, right. That's total, cool. Uh, great way to, 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 to have a need for Kubernetes at the edge, right? You want a, a uniform deployment layer uh, for all of the applications that you're building uh, with containers, and you know, you could then deploy it to a ride. You know, you could have Kubernetes mm -hmm. running on your <laughs> ride system. Like it's mm -hmm. crazy. Right? So uh, anyway, we'll we'll get into more of that. Uh, I think. Uh, sorry, Andrew. I, I just thought yeah, that was no worries. All good. Uh, I'm kind of glad that you mentioned K3 because that was actually the next point I was going to bring up. Um, so I know for me personally, when I was first learning about Kubernetes, uh, the first time I ever deployed a cluster was actually using K3s. Um, and it's funny because <laughs> one of my buddies here at AWS. Um, you know, I was asking him at the time because I just didn't know that much about Kubernetes. He was like, have you heard of this thing called K3s? And uh, I thought he was trolling me. So I was like, get out. Like, th this is not a thing. And he's like, no, 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 I'm serious. Like, there's this company called Rancher. Like, you should check it out. Uh, so I looked it up. And so the next thing I was going to say was that, you know, if you're someone that's interested in Kubernetes but not sure if it's quite right for you, um, I think K3s is actually a great way to kind of introduce yourself to the world of Kubernetes. Because uh, not only is it lightweight, but it's much cheaper than having to spin up a full-blown EKS cluster um, and use that as your plan. So my recommendation to folks that are you know, interested in, about Kubernetes and wants to experiment with it, um, my first recommendation is always to use K3s, which is another reason why I'm super excited to have Adrian on the show. Um, so with that said, uh, because you know Rancher is definitely Adrian's thing, I, I will handle with Adrian. Oh, you're right, the drivers, Uh oh. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I forgot what I was going to say. No. Hi. Um, is my screen sharing yet, or no? Is it just me? No, no, no. Let's get that oh, screen sharing going. All right. Rancher. Com. Rancher. Run Kubernetes everywhere. Hi, everybody. Um. I have a lot of stuff that I want to show you today, and I'm not just here to talk about Rancher. I said I'm the director of community and evangelism, but I've I've worked at Rancher for a number of years. I was a field engineer for a long time. I was in technical marketing for a while, and now I'm tasked with the joyous responsibility of bringing Rancher to the world across the board. We have a number of different products and projects. I kind of differentiate those between projects are the things that we're working on, pro Products are the things that are actually out in production. First of all, everything that Rancher does is 100% free and open source. So everything that you see me doing today, everything you see me talking about, you can go and do these things yourself. We have tremendous documentation. We have a fantastic community of people who are all, I don't know, dare I say fanatics. Um, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully today I can, I can show you enough about Rancher to get you really excited about going and figuring it out. And when I say open source, I really mean open source, not open core, not you pay us a license fee and you get a bunch more features. Like it's all really right there. If, if I start talking about the, the Rancher journey, like how we see Kubernetes, it'll frame everything else that I'm gonna show you. And then I'm gonna actually not talk about Rancher at all. And I'm just gonna talk about Kubernetes because I'm sure that there are some people who are here who are new in their Kubernetes journey. And those of you who are well-established in your Kubernetes journey, don't, don't worry. If we get to the end of this with everything that I have on my list of stuff here to do, um, I've got stuff for you too. So if, real quick, now that's not the slide that I wanted. All right, so real quick, this slide right here shows our model for how you can be successful with Kubernetes. And at the bottom, you've got a Kubernetes distribution. Now, you want to run a certified Kubernetes distribution. We have two of them. We have K3S, which some people say K3s, and that's fine too. Um, 
K3S is a super lightweight Kubernetes distribution certified by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's 100% upstream Kubernetes, but what we've done is we've removed all of the optional stuff. Like if you deploy stock Kubernetes inside of Amazon, well, you've still got all of this stuff for Google and Azure and other things that you're never going to use. So all of that stuff gets ripped out and we have the base core component, which means that we can run all of Kubernetes in less than 512 megabytes of RAM. And the binary to do so is it floats between 40 and 70 megabytes. So you can run K3S on a Raspberry Pi, on a T2 Micro, on, on anything that has at least a gigabyte of RAM. You've got 512 megs for Kubernetes, and you still got 512 megs for you to run your actual stuff. But it's not like Minikube or Kind or other single node Kubernetes clusters. It's actually a full-blown Kubernetes distribution. So you can run it in HA. You can run it in standalone. You can run it with the backing store of etcd. You can use MySQL. You can use a thing called DQ Lite, which is like a, an HA version of SQLite. The standalone one just uses SQLite. So it's, it's all there. It's production level. And then RKE was our first Kubernetes distribution, and it runs all of Kubernetes inside of Docker containers. So unlike other distributions where maybe you need work on the host itself we have to install networking and the proxy and the kubelet and you got to do all this stuff before you can stand up a cluster with rke you just need docker but then we also support any other cncf certified kubernetes distribution including eks including other stuff there including wherever you want to get your kubernetes once you have your kubernetes on top of that you really need some kind of management layer now we happen to have one it's called rancher and i'll show you that in a little bit but honestly if you can find any management layer that gives you simplified cluster operations and infrastructure management, security and authentication, shared tooling and services, and policy management, you'll be fine. And what that means is that your job, once you have Kubernetes deployed, is to let it work for you. And as engineers, we all get super excited about complexity, and we build these crazy things. We're like, yay, hey, we're the, the holders of secret knowledge, and only we can you know, master <laughs> the, the whatever to get to the top of the mountain. That just means that you can never go on vacation, you can never get promoted, and you're gonna be the one that they call in the middle of the night. So let Kubernetes do what it can do and put a management layer on top of it that does centralized authentication, global policy management, and all of these things to really give it power. And on top of that, you have your applications. We were developing a thing called Rio. Uh, it's still in super alpha, so we're not gonna talk about that. But this is, this is the model for success with Kubernetes. And then this, okay, the slide deck that I'm working off of is actually from a, a weekly rancher Kubernetes training that I do. So you'll see me jumping around and stuff. Yeah, you gotta, drop, us, you gotta drop a, a, a shout out real quick, uh, a plug for Rancher Academy, right? Oh yeah, that's huge. You gotta do that. <laughs> I was gonna throw that in at the end. No, I, right I now. Believe, right now, okay. <laughs> If you've ever encountered Rancher, or if after what you see today, if this is interesting to you and you want to learn more about it, a week ago, we launched the Rancher Academy. And it's a free certification program that right now is one course, which is the Certified Rancher Operator Level 1 course. It's four hours of video, 87 units, 37 labs. Um, if you spend three to five hours a week on it, it'll take you about five weeks to finish. But this will give you everything that you need to know about deploying Rancher and using Rancher to deploy and manage Kubernetes. And it's totally free. So you can get that at academy.rancher.com. And that's something that I and a bunch of other people at Rancher have been building for about the last four months. We launched it last Tuesday, and we already have more than 2,500 students, and we've issued almost 200 certificates just in the past week. So Rack asks, is it free? It's totally free. Be free, there you go, heard it right. So cool. go there, go sign up. Don't take it yet. Come back here and stay. <laughs> stay with us, <laughs> definitely. Cool. Should I talk about Kubernetes? Yeah, let's let's yeah. Let's I talk mean, about Kubernetes. This is like uh, the thing that anybody hears Kubernetes. Like, what is it? Why do I use it? What you know? This is the hardest hurdle, in my opinion, to to get over. Is like. It's it's not as simple as oh there's a three tier web uh, application that I'm you know deploying and I know how to put that onto the server and I know how to you know download packages onto the server. Kubernetes has its whole like its own vocabulary. It's got its own ecosystem like with all kinds of different stuff. There's a networking the lexicon. Yeah, there's yeah. a networking layer to it. There's storage layer to it. There's you know etcd which is. Uh, <laughs> 
terrifying uh, to, to run on your own, uh, in my opinion. So, yeah, I, I'd love to hear some, some uh, 101. Kubernetes 101. This is not going to be a full crash course on Kubernetes. Well, actually going to be a super crash course because this is the training that I normally do over the course of an hour and a half. But I, I want to just touch on the various components and then we're actually going to go and use these things uh, in an EKS cluster that I built earlier, just straight from the command line so you get an idea of how it works. I am a convert. I originally, when I started going into the Kubernetes world, I hated Kubernetes. I was a regular Docker user, then I was a rancher cattle user, and then this Kubernetes thing came along, and I'm like, this takes, like, I hate this. It takes longer to do things that I can do in other ways, so why would I ever use it? But I forced myself to use it. I built Kubernetes clusters, I lived inside of them, and you know, now, three years later, I only run Kubernetes clusters. I have them out in production, I have them in my house here in Chile, I, I just spin them up and spin them down, and I put everything on Kubernetes because it makes my life easier. But I used to describe the learning curve of Kubernetes as close to vertical. Yeah. And yeah, right? But think of it like driving. When you didn't know how to drive, driving was something you were never going to be able to figure out how to do. It was so daunting. And now you just get in a car and you drive. It's the same thing. Most of us who drive have no idea how an engine works other than like the basic mechanics of it. But if your car breaks down, you like call somebody and they come and they you know, deal with the engine stuff. You can use Kubernetes without needing to understand every aspect of its internals, and then you can learn those things over time. These things that you see on the screen, pods, replica sets, deployments, config map services, and ingresses are the basic building blocks that you need to actually do things. So pods are the smallest unit that can be deployed in Kubernetes. They usually consist of a container. If you've ever deployed anything as Docker containers, you know that you have issues when you start linking containers together and getting them to cross hosts and stuff. Pods solve that by running multiple containers in a shared space that gives them access to the same storage volume, the same network space. So now you can run you know, Apache and PHP with a fast CGI and talk to each other on localhost. It solves a tremendous number of issues that regular containers have. Scheduling, they're always going to be scheduled on the same host, so they'll always be right there. And then you can scale pods up, so you can have you know, one, two, three, five, ten, and get more power. This I ripped straight off from the Kubernetes website. It shows you an example of a multi-container pod. You've got a file puller that brings something in from a CMS, and then it saves it to a volume, which is just a disk, virtual disks. And then you've got a web server that pulls content from that volume and ships it out to consumers. If you needed more horsepower in your application, you would scale this up and it becomes a unit of the application. It provides a function. You wouldn't, for example, have a web server and a database server because if you need more web servers, you don't need more database servers. They can't talk to each other. That's a terrible example, but just you see why you wouldn't do it. <laughs> Everything in Kubernetes is YAML and we're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> That's just how it is. <laughs> this is just how it is. Oh, nobody, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, "Oh, you know what? I want to write a bunch of YAML." This is no. There but might be somebody. like somebody. Uh, might. They work for Google. Then they work for Google. <laughs> um, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sure. it's important, much like the car, it's important that you understand that that the manifest, which is what's written in YAML, is what tells Kubernetes what to do. Kubernetes operates off of two states, the actual state and the desired state. The actual state is the actual state. It's the way that things are. The desired state is what you want. So when you tell Kubernetes you want three pods running, it looks and it says, oh, I have zero pods running. And then it does whatever it needs to do to go from zero pods to three pods. And if one of those pods dies, it says, oh, well, the desired state is three and I currently have two, so let me start a third one and move it around and, and do a bunch of stuff. That's Kubernetes' job, is to maintain state and to reconcile between the desired state and the actual state. You tell it what to do by applying YAML or by using Rancher. Um, <laughs> I prefer the second. Like, yeah, you know, we're gonna yeah, we're gonna 100%. go through. We're gonna show you a bunch of YAML. I just I want to very quickly run through uh, replica sets and deployments, and then we're gonna get right into this. And you're gonna very quickly be like, "Wow, I don't ever want to do this. Let's find a better way." And then I'll show you a better way. <laughs> you're never gonna make replica sets, but replica sets define the scale and state of a group of pods. So when I said earlier that you know if you have zero pods and you want three pods, those pods are in what's called a replica set. But replica sets don't present a really good way of managing them, so you're never going to make them. Instead, you're going to make what's called a deployment. A deployment creates a replica set. A replica set creates a bunch of pods. 
and then the deployment manages the replica set and the replica set manages the pods. The deployment gives you an interface for doing things like changing the container image or doing rolling updates or changing the scale and the number of pods and things like that. This is what you're going to first do with Kubernetes. And this is probably where you're going to spend most of your time with Kubernetes. I mentioned state earlier, actual state and desired state. That's different from stateless applications. If you think of stateful and stateless apps, a stateless app is like HTTP. Without something like Redis for sessions or anything like that, you like the this web server doesn't know who you are from request to request. That's a stateless app. Stateless apps can be defined as they're just, they're not special. It doesn't matter which host you land on. Doesn't matter you know if it's seen you before. It doesn't matter if one gets deleted and another one gets started. They're not unique and special snowflakes. Stateless apps are built by deployments inside of Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes can also do stateful apps like databases and do some other stuff, but we don't have time for that. Today we're going to do just deployments. Yeah, there's some there's some challenges with with stateful sets versus stateless. I, I've 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 run into mm -hmm. there are. Hang on, I gotta turn my heater off here. Um, well, Kubernetes was designed for stateless applications originally. Right. It was designed to run large quantities of stateless applications at scale, and then people were like, "Oh, I want to put a database on it." Originally, it did that very badly. Yeah, um. I mean. <laughs> For me, since I live in AWS all day, every day, uh, you know, uh, breaking that out into something like Aurora, right, and just using Aurora is, is to me, an easier approach. But, but there are definitely uh, a lot more newer things in stateful sets and, and persistent volumes and persistent volume claims and all this stuff. So uh, I, th I think at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, like, what is important to me as a business owner uh, or, or a company? to run myself, right? Like that that's generally how I kind of look at these things. Like, is it is it worthwhile for me to run a database inside? Oh, and then uh, one other quick point I want to bring up. So earlier you talked about, you know, working with YAML every day is probably the most enjoyable thing in the world. Um, so one thing I want to add is with Kubernetes, you can actually create objects imperatively. So even though it's not recommended for a production workload, if you're just learning, you could totally create a lot of the things that Aiden talked about just using the command line um, and then just copy it to a file uh, to kind of help yourself learn kind of what the structure of the YAML file is supposed to look like, um, opposed to having to go to the documentation and just doing a bunch of copy and paste. Um, just want to throw that out there. Well, I'll actually show that. Oh, He's okay. absolutely yeah. right. There, there are, well, let's, let's look at, all right. So this is a pod manifest. Pods. You know, with kind pod, the API version key tells Kubernetes where in its API definitions to go find the thing that you're asking it to create, which in this case is a pod. Metadata we would talk about later, and we probably won't just because of the nature of how this is. But here the spec says containers. There's a list that has one. It's going to be called my app-container. It's going to run the busybox image, and it's going to override the command with this. It's just going to say echo hello Kubernetes and then sleep for one second and then exit. And Understanding what I told you a moment ago about state, when we apply this, to the cluster, it's going to create a pod. And we can see that happening. This is an EKS cluster. So we can see that the pod was created, it ran, it exited, and we're watching this and it should restart. And then it should exit, and then it should restart, and then it should go into a state called crash loop back off. There you go. The reason to, for that is because not to derail mm -hmm. like entirely, Adrian, but uh, just just real quick, this this CLI tool that you're using, uh, Cube Cuddle or Cube Control or Cube CTL, whatever, however yep. you want to say, yep. it. what is yep. this? This is the tool for interacting with a Kubernetes cluster. When you build a cluster, you're given a kube config file, which has information in there about how to access the cluster, either via TLS certificate or a token or one of various other means. And then kubectl uses that to authenticate with the cluster and then apply manifests and interact with the API. So we can interact with the cluster, see nodes, apply things, delete things, move things around, do everything that you need to do with Kubernetes via this one command. And, and how do you pronounce it? I say Coop CTL. Okay. 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 Cuddle Cuddle just makes me think of Cuddlefish. Yeah. And it's Kubernetes and Cuddlefish. Just it's not it's like <laughs> you no, know, I don't know. It's like Kubo octopus or something. I don't know. 
I'm with you. Uh, yeah, you, you've got so, some you've got some people in chat agreeing with you. CTL is is the best. Uh, so. But you may say it however you like. True. It is totally. it is yours. You are you are embarking on a relationship with it. If it's you know it's it's whatever whatever. Make it yours. Most yes. Most people actually just abbreviate it to K because they get tired of typing kubectl. And once you spend any time in Kubernetes, uh, you, you'll do the same. So what you've seen here is the pod exited, Kubernetes restarts it, it exited, Kubernetes restarts it, and Kubernetes is like, well, obviously this isn't working. So before I restart this, let me just wait a few seconds. Restarted it again, no, it crashed again. Let me wait a few more seconds. And it continues to increase what's called a back off timer so that it's not crashing the system by trying to start something all of the time. You imagine this scaled across hundreds of pods, you know, things that obviously, you know, it doesn't know why they're not starting. Either a human needs to fix it or it's waiting on a database or something. So that's the crash loop back off. And it'll continue to increase that timer out to 10 minutes and then it'll reset it again. So let me just delete that. Uh, you see I have abbreviations, so kubectl or we can do krmpo my app dash pod. We had a recommendation for another tool. Um, I actually haven't used this, uh, I have to be honest. Uh, K9s or K9s. Uh, have you ever used that, Adrian? Nope, I have not. I haven't either. I'll have, to, I'll have to check it out. Sounds interesting. I looked it up. It's like a kind of a terminal UI. Sounds like is it? For, hmm. for exploring uh, clusters is, is what Tesseract says. Hmm. OK. Cool. Thanks uh, for the rec. All right. So let's, let's move on now to deployments. I want to be mindful of the time. Understand, I am, like all of you who are watching, I am running you through fast Kubernetes stuff um, just to give you a, a, a touch on it. But if you want this at a slower pace, um, I do a weekly training. You can go to rancher.com and look up the trainings there. The next one will be tomorrow afternoon. And, and I spend a lot more time going through all of this. So I spend about an hour on Kubernetes and then about a half an hour on Rancher. So you're welcome to come along yeah. for that. Academy.rancher.com too. Check that out. So a deployment is a much larger manifest. And basically it's it's the wrappers around the wrapper around the pod. So if you see, you know, we're saying that we want one replica and then there's a template. The template contains what is basically the information that was in our pod definition before. So you see that there's you know, metadata, there's a spec, there's a container. In this case, we're just going to launch the Nginx 1.17 Alpine container and some other stuff around how that's going to happen. But I'm not going to, actually, you know what? I'll take this opportunity to, to show what, what Andrew described. If we, there's a lot of ways that you can do something in Kubernetes. Uh, one of them is you can apply an existing manifest um, you can create a deployment uh, by using kubectl create, and then we say the deployment, nginx, and we pass it the image that we want. You can also tell it to do that with dash dash dry run and dash o yaml. And what this will do is this will create the manifest that it would apply, but it won't apply it. And then it'll output it as yaml to you. So if we redirect this to... deployment.yaml. We had a question real quick from chat as well. Uh, Tesseract yeah. wants to know, uh, is there a difference between a replica set and a deployment? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that in just a second. Let me actually launch this deployment and then I'll show you the difference. Yeah. So I just created this YAML manifest with this command that you see up here at the top, kubectl create deploy dry run dash o YAML, and then I outputted it to a file. And we could now apply this to the cluster, and it's just going to create a deployment for us. Oh, my little computer is working really hard with all of this camera and streaming and monitors <laughs> and stuff. Uh, so we can say kubectl get deploy. This is just short for deployments. And it says we have a deployment called nginx. And it says that there's one 
ready or one out of one ready, one is up to date, one is available and it's been around for 15 seconds. If we say kubectl get replica set, you'll see that we have a replica set called nginx dash something. And if we say kubectl get pods, you'll see that we have a pod that has the same identifier as the replica set. So what happened here is the deployment actually created a replica set and then the replica set created the pods. The deployment manages the replica set and the replica set manages the pods. There used to be a thing called a replication controller that was how you built replica sets and it wasn't very effective for doing things like rolling updates and things. So they built a deployment controller instead. And that's, you'll never need to worry about making a replica set yourself. You just create a deployment and it just takes care of it for you. It's just this intermediate layer. I want to ask in the chat, let me know if you use some type of infrastructure as code tooling like Terraform or if you use you know, Puppet or Ansible or Chef or anything like that. Just tell me uh, if people are saying yes, no, or whatever. Because I'm not, I don't actually have the stream up because uh, it would just kill my bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, we've, uh, so, so we had a question around uh, namespaces in Kubernetes and, and Kube uh, CTL, uh, how okay. we deal with namespaces. And there's a, a default namespace. There's also a Kube system namespace um, that, that things get created in. Um, so yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, Adrian. Namespaces are logical, well, Kubernetes documentation describes them as virtual clusters inside of the cluster. I don't like that definition because I think right. of a cluster as having multiple nodes and, and stuff. The way that I think of a namespace is everything in Kubernetes has to be unique. So you can't have two deployments with the same name. Otherwise, how does it know which one you're talking to? You can't have pods with the same name. So imagine that you had a deployment called website and you wanted to have a production version of your website and a staging version of your website in the same cluster. Well, you couldn't have two things called website. So you would have to create separate manifests, one for staging and one for production, and you'd have to remember to switch the names. And now your development or staging environment is different from your production environment. And there's a lot of human has to remember stuff going on. And I believe very strongly that anything that humans have to remember will eventually fail because we're terrible. We're terrible at it. Namespaces allow you to group things and then within a namespace, something has to be unique. So you could have a production namespace and a staging namespace and inside each of them, you could have a thing called website. And now the deployment of stuff, all of the manifests can be effectively the same. You just change the namespace that you're talking to. When you're talking to staging, great, it's over here. When you're talking to production, it's over here, but all the names are the same. You can switch namespaces with a very complicated kubectl command, or there's a really cool free scripty thing called kubeNS, K-U-B-E-N-S. And this gives you a way to switch namespaces and also a way to switch what's called contexts. Your kubectl config file can have definitions inside of it to talk to multiple clusters, or you can have multiple configs in an environment variable. And then switching between them using kubectl is also a pain in the butt. But the kubes KCTX, he has another one, I've abbreviated it as KCC, allows you to switch contexts. So you can switch, you know, I'm talking to this cluster, now I'm talking to that cluster, now I'm talking to this cluster over here. I aliased kube NS to this. So if I said uh, NS Nginx Ingress, I am now talking to, I will, there we go. I am now talking to the Nginx Ingress namespace. And so if I were to get pods, you'd see that I have a totally different set of pods because they're running in a different namespace. If I switch back to defaults, and then I run kubectl get pods. We've had a yep. bunch, of, uh, bunch of love for a lot of uh, infrastructure as code solutions. OK. Uh, well, this is good. This this dovetails right into what I was just talking about with namespaces and overlapping names and things like that. There is a tool called Customize. Customize allows you to template your Kubernetes manifests so that you can apply infrastructure as code or even GitOps style um, you know, source of truth to them. 
they built Customize into kubectl. That's a pretty you know, nice check from the Kubernetes people that says, yeah, this is a good thing. And now you can build out these templates. And if you do kubectl apply dash K, it'll actually switch to the Customize engine and allow you to do stuff. So let me show you very quickly how Customize works. And then we'll go back and we'll talk about how you could use this in a staging or a production environment. Cool. We have here, okay, so I deployed that thing directly. Uh, let me actually remove that. Karen. I think that was called Nginx. Yeah, cool. So in this directory, you see that I have two directories called base and overlay. If you look in base, you see that we have the deployment.yaml that I just created. Let me actually reset that to its original form. So we have the deployment.yaml, which is this big thing that doesn't matter. If we look at customization.yaml, here is what customize is going to look at, or kubectl when using the customize engine. And it's pretty simple. It says, what do you want to install? Well, we want to install deployment.yaml and service.yaml, and we want to make a config map. We won't get into config maps today, but if you come to my class tomorrow, I'll talk about them as well. The deployment.yaml is a file that's here. Service.yaml is a file that's here. And so if I say kubectl apply dash k dot, then it will take that customization file and you see that it just went out and it created a config map, a service, and a deployment. And okay, you're like, okay, so what? That's cool. Well, we could check this into a Git repository. And in fact, this is in a Git repository. Um, so you could check this out and you could run the exact same kubectl apply command and you would get the exact same result. So the Git repository becomes the source of truth. And this brings IAC style stuff into Kubernetes. But where it gets super cool, you see that I have a deployment called Nginx. This is just the default deployment that we created a moment ago. If I come up to one of these overlay directories, you see that I have production and staging. If we look at the customization file in staging, well, now there's some more interesting stuff going on. You've got a name prefix of staging dash. You've got a common label that will be applied to every single Kubernetes resource that gets created. Kubernetes uses labels to find things. So the replica set that I say it, it manages a bunch of pods, it doesn't know what those pods are, but each of those pods has a label in the metadata section that has some arbitrary number of key value pairs like app, nginx, and environment equals staging. And then the replica set is looking for pods that have that label. So any pod that has that label or those combination of labels, it will manage. And that's how Kubernetes, they're called selectors. That's how the load balancers find their stuff. That's how deployments, everything is done with labels. So this will put a common label on every single resource of environment is staging. Then it will go back out and it will use the base directory that we were just working in with the deployment that we just deployed, but it's going to patch it with some stuff in the current directory. If I were to look at image.yaml, you'll see that this will change the container image. And if I were to look at replicacount.yaml, you'll see that the number of replicas is also slightly different. Uh, if we go back to Right, so it patches it and it'll also create a slightly different config map, which again, we're not gonna get into today. So when I apply this with kubectl apply dash K, and I just pointed at the directory that has the customization.yaml, you see that it created a config map, a service and a deployment. And if I do the same thing for the production environment, and I'm not gonna show you its stuff, but just know that it has its own set of labels and its own environment stuff, you see that it created its own set of things. And now when we say kubectl get deploy, you'll see that we have the default and we have prod nginx and we have staging nginx. Prod has three replicas. It's running a different container image. Staging has one replica. It's running a later, more recent container image. 
because you know we're willing to take risks in staging. But all of these were built <laughs> off of the, the base image that we saw earlier. So now you've got templating for your Kubernetes manifest. You can get into GitOps. You can start pushing this stuff up there. If the whole cluster melts down, you can redeploy things directly from the Git repository. And though it's a little bit more work to learn this, I highly recommend that you invest the time to do it, especially if you've done anything with any type of configuration management, you understand the value of repeatability. I'll pause there in case there's questions or in case I've been disconnected from the chat because it's been totally quiet. <laughs> oh, actually, um, I think you talked about a, a few important points. Um, and so I'm personally a huge fan of being able to use imperative commands to create things like namespaces and services. Um, so I think there's a couple questions in chat about kind of how you would do so. Um, could you maybe show us like how you would create a namespace just using the CLI um, and then deploying a pod into that namespace? It's super easy, and I think once you learn how to do it, it makes using Kubernetes like ten times easier. I will create a namespace called Andrew. There you go. Kubectl create namespace Andrew. Done. I will switch to the Andrew namespace. Uh, hit tab. There we go. Tab completion. Now. Remember, ns is actually the kubeNS command. The way to do this with kubectl is so convoluted that I don't even remember it. Just go and install <laughs> kubeNS. And exactly. <laughs> you just don't have to worry about it. Uh, so oops. so there's nothing in here right now. So if I were to kubectl create deploy nginx, and we'll just run the nginx 117 alpine. And now if we look at kubectl get pods, you'll see that we have an nginx container running. And that is totally different from the default namespace where all of our prod and staging and, and other stuff is still running. Yeah, we've had, we've had a few questions about uh, essentially networking things, which networking in Kubernetes is a little complex because you have to worry about the internal networking system. There's an right. internal DNS. And then obviously like the networking uh, between nodes and the networking out to, uh, you know, external uh, as well. So uh, they they were asked, a few people, Kang it and, and Tesseract were asking, uh, so in a namespace, right? You have two different mm -hmm. namespaces. You've got Andrew, you've got default. Uh, yep. These pods can't automatically talk to each other. Um, that's that's not how it works. Ooh, oh, okay. well. So you it's not, it's not it's, <laughs> it depends. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's tricky. Right. Right. So we've we've had some uh, multiple questions around uh, how do you get pods in different namespaces to talk or can they already or uh, anything like that. So I, I think beautiful. Perfect. There. Let's let's switch gears. Pods have IPs. So let's just look at this guy right here. So when, when you want to look at how Kubernetes sees something, you would use kubectl describe. And if I run that out to less, you will see that this pod has an IP. Now this IP is, I mean, the pod itself is essentially ephemeral. These are stateless applications. No pod is particularly special. So new pods get new IPs. If we delete this pod or if we blow up this host and it gets launched on another host, it's going to have a different IP. So I could log into this pod, I could shell into it, and I could communicate directly with the IP of the other pod. Because unless I have restrictions prohibiting cross namespace traffic, and Kubernetes doesn't care. It's like, whatever. It's just a logical separation. All this stuff is happening within IP tables. And it's like, yeah, sure, whatever. You can talk. But you never want to talk to pods because you can't trust that they'll be there. So gone. what you want to create, they're gone. Yeah, they're, they're uh, any analogy that I can make, um, you know, like ex-girlfriends or whatever, it's, it's <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, man. You can't, you can't, you can't trust pods. <laughs> No, pods are ephemeral. So you put a service in front of them. And a service's job, it's another logical thing. A service's job is to use a selector to track a group of pods. 
And the service has a stable IP and a stable DNS name. And I'll show you a service in just a second. When you communicate with the service, it does essentially a layer four load balancer. It just round robins traffic across the pods. If the pod goes away, it falls out of the service definition. Or if a pod has a, a readiness check that fails, the service won't send traffic to it until it comes back. Add new pods, scale them up. The service is what you want to talk to. So if you think, imagine that you have a web application running in a bunch of pods and you've got Redis running somewhere else. Redis is going to be a stateful thing, but let's just pretend for a moment that it's not. You would put a service in front of Redis and your web application pods would talk to the service and the service is always going to be there. We have actually created services in our cluster. You can see that we have three of them. Uh, now, there are, there are three types of services and each one contains the one before. There's a cluster IP service. This is a service that exists only within the cluster. It has a private IP address, and it's just for like the example earlier where maybe you have like memcache, for example. You don't need to talk to memcache from outside the cluster, so it just has an IP inside the cluster. The next one is node port. It creates a cluster IP service, but then it opens a port on every node in the cluster between 30,000 and 32767, and traffic that lands on that port gets routed to the service and then gets routed to the pods. But you're never going to tell anybody, oh, my website is example.com colon 31683. Come visit. So that doesn't work. <laughs> Where you use node port services is when you have an external load balancer. And so you would put all of the hosts and the high port in the load balancer. You send traffic to the load balancer. It sends traffic to the host. And then it does health checking. And if a node goes away, it just fails it. Or you can create a load balancer service. And if your cluster is built correctly, meaning that it's in a cloud provider and it knows it's in a cloud provider and it knows, well, it has some extra configuration that the cloud provider requires for it to do some magic. For example, in the case of AWS, the hosts themselves have to be able to create load balancers. Once you have all of that stuff set up, then you can create a load balancer service. And in fact, if I switch to the Nginx ingress namespace, I created one of these earlier. When you create a load balancer service, it first creates a cluster IP service, then it creates a node port service, and then it reaches out over the AWS API and it creates an ELB. It can also create an NLB, but whatever. By default, it creates an ELB. And it configures the ELB with all of the hosts in the cluster and with that node port where things are listening, and then it maintains that configuration as hosts come and go configuration for you. Now that works if you're in a cloud provider. If you're not in a cloud provider, if you're on-prem, there's a service called Metal LB service. There's an application called Metal LB, also open source. You can install that in your cluster and it will either do uh, IP address assignment and ARP for announcements, or it can connect directly to a BGP fabric and do route announcements into BGP. This horrible thing here wrapped but you see here that for external IP, I actually have an ELB that was created. And that is routing to 30929 for port 80 and 32454 for port 443. And if we were to go and hit that, we'd actually get a 404, um, but it would come from the cluster. Oh, 404. So that's from the ELB to the cluster and all that was automatically built by Kubernetes. Are there more questions? Yes, there are. There's, there's a oh, ton. Man. We're never going to get to the rancher part. Okay. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> we're we're, we're going to get to the rancher part, but I need to definitely pare down my list of exciting stuff that I was going to show everybody. Hang it. Hang right. it. Fifteen uh, has two separate questions. One is around uh, customize. So uh, yeah. deploying uh, different pods like you did uh, is is that possible without customize, or is that just what customize does. That's what customize does. Customize. So customize took the base template and then it applied all of these things to it. So everything that was created from the staging customization file has the prefix of staging and has environment staging. You could certainly go in and do all of this yourself. But the whole point of configuration management is to free you to do other things and to make sure that things are done the same way every single time so you don't have configuration drift across your environment. Oh, right. That's just what customized stuff. Super important. 
And then the other one, Andrew, you want to grab the other question? Yeah, uh, there's a lot going on in the oh, chat. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh, how many people yeah, are so, how many people are how many people are here right now? Uh, right now, ninety. Yeah. Nice. Hi, everyone. Okay. Yeah. Question. Go for it. Um, so there's two ways that you can track logs in Kubernetes, and this is kind of one of the problems that Kubernetes fixes is that if you have a pod. And you're just curious, you know, what is going on with my pod? Uh, you could do what Asian described, where you just describe the pod and kind of see what's going on or what the pod is doing. Or you could also use the imperative command, where you just go kubectl logs, the name of your pod, and then theoretically, if everything's going okay, it'll show you exactly what's going on with the logs um, that is associated with the pod. Um, so again, imperative commands, huge fan. But they show two different things. Right, exactly. Kubectl yeah. describe, and so this is the, the, the problem with Kubernetes that, that was at the beginning of the question. And and you'll use both of them. If, where, let's, uh, let's, Kubectl describe, actually, hang on, which, which one of these? I will, I will show you this exact problem. Oh, I'm in the... I'm in the wrong namespace. <laughs> and we were also bringing up uh, uh, Prometheus too as an option for for distributed logging across you know all of your your deployments and services and mm -hmm. you know et cetera all the all the Kubernetes objects that you're you're working with. Okay, I would like to see what's going on with this pod. I want to know what its image is. And I see that it is running Nginx 1.17 Alpine. Let's say that I wanted to change this. I wanted to, for whatever reason, actually, we can look at the staging. I'll use this as an example. OK, so staging Nginx, I know this is running 1.16 Alpine. So kubectl set image. I'm going to intentionally typo that. So let's say, let's say that we're just doing this manually. And we say staging Nginx, we want to update the staging Nginx deployment to run 1.17 Alpine, but we, we mess it up. So we say, okay, and it says, cool, Kubernetes is like, all right, I'll, I'll get right on that. Uh, we say kubectl rollout status deploy staging nginx. I have to be careful with my typing because there's huge yeah. lag because of the, the number of things my machine is doing. So ordinarily, you would be able to watch this and it would tell you the status of the rollout as it goes across the cluster. But this is never going to finish because we typoed it. But we let's just pretend we don't know that. So we shift into troubleshooting mode. And we say, OK, you know, we've waited for a few minutes. And we're like, wow, this seems to be taking a long time. We say kubectl get deploy uh, actually, we say kubectl get pod because we're rolling out pods. We want to know what's the status. And we see that we have an error. Now, mm. this is, it's important to note that if we were doing this on the production, we would still have this error, but the production pods would still be up because the way that we have it configured is it's going to launch new pods and then kill old pods. So the site's still up and running. The customers are still on it. Our boss is not angry. We're not going to get fired. We can take the time to go and troubleshoot this and you know breathe deeply and we don't have to be freaking out. Image pull back off. If we were to say kubectl get logs, or sorry, kubectl logs dash f, and then pass it that pod, well, that pod doesn't exist yet. It was never created. Yeah. So, so logs are standard out and standard error output from your application. And there's information. If the pod started, but the application is failing, then that's what you get there. We need to go back into kubectl describe and look at that and look down at the events section. This is from Kubernetes's perspective of the pod as an object. And if we scroll down to the bottom, this is everything that happened since the pod was born. You see that it got assigned to some horrible host name. Um, <laughs> and, and then eventually you see an error that, you know, oh, the manifest was not found. We realized that we made a mistake. So we come in here and we say kubectl rollout undo deploy staging nginx and it's going to roll it back and now we can go do it the better way to avoid this 
in a customized example with a GitOps model, we would actually edit uh, staging image .yaml, and we would change this to be 1.16 Alpine. And then we would say kubectl apply dash k staging. And in a GitOps model, we would actually commit this to a repo. It would go through some sort of QA so that it would have detected the typo. Once all the QA passed, then it would update uh, something on the actual system itself, would pull that down, or it would do a kubectl apply directly, and the cluster would get updated. So you never talk to the cluster directly. You're actually going through a Git repo as the source of truth. And that prevents you from having a situation where, you know, I'm sitting at home and I updated the cluster and then I close my laptop and I get hit by a car and then the cluster, nobody knows the current state of the cluster or how it got to, to where it is. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> like it. People always use that like, oh, what happens if you get by? But I, what I like, you know, not getting hit by a car. Adrian, you won the lottery. Okay. Never to be hurt. I won the lottery. Me. That's right. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I discovered oil in my backyard. I don't want to think. <laughs> the thing is, I like you. I, yeah, like I don't, you I, don't, I, don't want to get, I don't want to get hit by a car. You're absolutely right. Um, Knock on wood. How about this? I, 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 cl I close my laptop and the power supply catches on fire and my, a freak lightning storm happens and whatever. The, it, uh, somebody runs by with a VCR degosser. And <laughs> it's also negative. No, no, you just you, you, you no? retire to a, like an, a, a private island that you own now because you, you're rich and, and famous. Because but but in that situation, success. I think, yes. <laughs> But but it also makes it sound like I'm unavailable. Like people can't call me up and be like, "What did you do to the cluster?" I'd be like, "I'm not going to tell you. I retired." Like, yeah, you're done. <laughs> you're gone. You're, you're out of that. Life. That's oh, their no. problem now. Uh, so actually, we, we we had a question. I think we'll uh, we'll put you into a good transition uh, yep. uh, phase to start talking about Rancher. Uh, okay. So Chiroka asks, has Rancher uh, support for cleanup resources after? Uh, decommissioning uh, processes. So uh, I, I think that's that's just so we we could talk about that, uh, but that's a good way to introduce Rancher in general um, for anyone yeah. who is unfamiliar with Rancher. What does Rancher do? Before we get into the answer, can you uh, can you clean up resources after you you know are, are doing something? I am going to understand that question uh, to be resources outside of Kubernetes. So full lifecycle management of host resources or cluster resources. So that'll be nodes or entire EKS clusters, for example. And the answer is yes. But it depends on how you have launched the cluster. So great, here's, here's a transition. So I have one cluster running here. It's a K3S cluster. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but Rancher can launch clusters via all sorts of methods. We can actually launch EKS clusters directly. You just put your cloud credentials in here and set up node pools, and then you just spin up an EKS cluster and Rancher does everything for you. And then when you're done with it, you can tear it back down and Rancher will go out and delete all of the components for it. We can do the same thing with EC2. The difference between EKS is EKS obviously is EKS, but with EC2, we will provision infrastructure and then we will install Docker onto it and then we will install RKE, which is our larger, beefier Kubernetes distribution. At the moment, because of how K3S is deployed, we can't deploy K3S for you, but we can import K3S clusters. K3S is super easy to install and I'm going to actually do an installation of it. Um, okay. Yeah, we're back on track. We got lots of time. I'm going to do an installation of it in a little bit. Um, and then you import it. And the import is actually cool because you can import any Kubernetes cluster that you have from anywhere. So if you already have Kubernetes clusters, whether they're EKS or EC2, in fact, we can go and import our EKS cluster, which we'll do also in a second. I have this list of nice. stuff. Before, before so we, you just to derail you, uh, you know. Into totally, yeah, yep. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> before you get like deeper and deeper into it, uh, let's, let's do a recap real quick for uh, anyone joining the stream. Um, at, who we are, what are we doing? Andrew, you want to you want to tackle that real quick? Yeah. So if you're just tuning into the stream, uh, this is Howdy Partner. This is a show where we bring on all of our full partners to show off kind of what they do and what they focus on. And today we have Adrian, uh, Director of Community Evangelism, uh, representing Brancher. So if you're new to the stream, make sure you subscribe and uh, welcome to the show. Here you go. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Nice.
Ah, top of the hour. I see. It's like uh, it's like radio. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back to this. So yes. you can import existing clusters from anywhere. Any cluster you have running in the wild will give you kubectl apply command. You can import them. And then for those of you who do your node provisioning via any other means whatsoever. For example, I don't personally use the EC2 infrastructure deployment option. I prefer to deploy my EC2 nodes with auto scaling groups. And then the I use Cloud Init and as the final, so I'll deploy the nodes um, and then Cloud Init will update them and then install Docker. And then um, when you have a custom cluster, it gives you a Docker run command. And that's unique for the cluster itself. So if I select, for example, I want etcd and control plane, I can just put this Docker run command into the cloud init statement, or you can put it in Terraform, or you can put it in whatever you use for provisioning. And now in my auto scaling group, if I scale up, the nodes automatically join the cluster. And scaling down, obviously, I don't want to just go in and like nuke nodes, but I could. Um, but it's better to drain them and actually like you know do that a little bit more sensibly. Plus, with auto scaling groups, you never know which one it's going to remove. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> but for any other provisioning that you use, yeah, it's always it's a crapshoot. Um, for any other provisioning that you use, there's custom. So we have all of these different ways to deploy things. And we also, we work with a bunch of different providers. Obviously, this is an Amazon stream, but you can even add your own providers. So if you have on-prem environments or anything, you know, using vSphere or whatever, there's there's ways to get the drivers in here so that you can consolidate all of that into one rancher environment. And that's what? really, yeah, that's, so Rancher is about multi-cluster management. All of your clusters go into here. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, you know, one, one management layer to rule them all, one management layer to bind them. Weren't you making Hobbit references earlier when I was talking about having two lunches? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you told me today you had a uh, second lunch. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even think they know about second lunch, you know, that's... Uh, uh, yeah, onesies and, or elevensies. Okay. Low and right. Let me, <laughs> let, let, me, let me show you what Rancher can do yeah. just using the stuff that we did a moment ago. So you see here I have one cluster. This is a K3S cluster. If I select that, I'm brought into the interface for that particular cluster. We have what are called projects, and projects are collections of namespaces. So earlier we created the Andrew namespace and we had the default namespace. In Kubernetes, the security boundary for role-based access control is actually on the namespace itself. So if you have clusters that are large clusters for development teams, you might have dozens or hundreds of namespaces and different teams might need access or even individuals might need access to multiple namespaces. But when you have a change in the organization or a change to the group membership, you as a human being have to now go and make that change across a bunch of different namespaces and that's just not very much fun. So Rancher bundles namespaces into a project and you apply the security configuration to the project and it propagates down to all of the namespaces. So now you change something in one place and it gets applied everywhere. But back out at the global layer, since now I'm talking about RBAC, at the global, so this is now above all of the clusters that Rancher is managing, you can plug this into any backend identity provider that you see here. This enables all of those users and groups to be applied to permissions for all of the clusters. So if you think, like, why is this useful? If you're in an enterprise organization and you have clusters in AWS and some other places, you know, on-prem or wherever, and you have somebody who joins the organization, you might have to go in and make configuration in Active Directory, you might have a configuration as an IAM policy and a configuration in a bunch of other places. And then, if somebody leaves the organization, you have to figure out, well, what do they have access to? And you have to go around and delete all of this stuff in all these different places. And it's just more work and more headache. By plugging Rancher into, for example, Active Directory, when somebody joins the organization, you just put them in the group, and that group has been assigned to clusters across the entire Rancher infrastructure, and now they have access. And if somebody leaves the organization, you just disable their account in Active Directory, and they immediately lose access to everything. It centralizes all of your authentication, and then handles hands the authorization component off to Kubernetes to do all of its stuff with role-based access control. Super, super time saver that you'll reap immediate benefits from this out of the box. And you can use GitHub or SAML or OpenLDAP or whatever you want. 
back into the cluster thing. So if we jump over here into default, if I say deploy, all right, imagine now that we're using Kubernetes and we're not super Kubernetes nerds like some of us are. Um, but you want to use Kubernetes without necessarily needing to spend the time to learn it, or you want to be able to learn it over the course of time, but you still have to use it today. Well, we can come in here and we can say, you know, I want to deploy a workload called Nginx. I want this to be the Nginx 1.17 Alpine image. We're going to put it in the default namespace because that's all we've got. We're going to do a scalable deployment of, let's say, three pods. And here you see that we could select staple sets and daemon sets and the other stuff that we didn't get into. We're going to open up port 80 as a, sure, we'll make it a node port. And then we can start to you know, add environment variables if we need them, or we could come down and we could add volumes, or we could show the advanced options and start to get into things like resource limits or some of the, the more granular control things that maybe you don't care about in the beginning. You just want to launch something. And we can just say, we can close this because it's totally in my way. And we just say launch. And this is going to go out and it's going to launch stuff. We could, if we want to be one of those nerds, we could come in here and we could directly view the YAML and we could edit this YAML directly if we wanted to change replicas or anything. Or we could just come back in here and say edit and we're taken back into that form to make whatever changes we want. Because we gave it a port, it automatically created a service for us. And you can see that that was 32459. And if we open that in another tab over here. Oh, wait, nice. So it, it does the deployment and the service together. Yeah, it does. Oh. Now, this this is actually going to fail because I launched this on an EC2 node, and it doesn't know its public IP. There's a way around that, but I did these very quickly. So theoretically, this this would work. And if I do this with a load balancer service, it actually would work. But yeah, it creates a service for you so that you don't have to worry about it. That's great. Um, we did have a question real quick, I think, uh, maybe around yeah. one of those granular options uh, that you were, you were asking. Does Rancher, uh, John P333 asks, does Rancher have any network security features at the namespace level? Mm. John P, you are my hero. John P333, <laughs> was it? John 333, yeah. John P333, yes. It's like I fed you a script to ask me questions during the, the, the stream. It's perfect. <laughs> oh, really? John, John P, are you a plant? You have to tell us. Just the P stand for plant. P is P. <laughs> He's a ringer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's jump back out to the cluster. Oops. Let's jump back to global. And let's say I wanted to create a new cluster. Add cluster. And let's say that I wanted it to be, well, let's, let's just do custom. And let's look at the options that we have here for Kubernetes options. Now, this is going to deploy an RKE cluster, Rancher Kubernetes Engine. And we have four CNI drivers available for RKE. If you select Canal, so Flannel is super basic, Calico, is pretty cool. It uses BGP for communication between nodes, and it's a little more complicated. But one of the things that Calico has is network isolation. Well, Canal is a combination of the easiness of Flannel and the security policies of Calico in an easy-to-deploy CNI driver. If you have Canal selected and you turn on project network isolation, then projects, pods in one project cannot communicate with pods in another project. It's, it's good, but if you need bulletproof security, you're actually better off building two clusters. There are ways around this. If somebody could get on the host, for example, or if they could get into a pod that had administrative level privileges, like the, the stuff that people can do if they get, if they can touch it, they can compromise it. But for general stuff, uh, imagine a multi-cluster, so single cluster multi-tenancy. Imagine you have uh, a largest cluster and you've got different development teams on it. You could enable project isolation, and then you could have teams assigned, different teams assigned to different projects. And when somebody from team A logs in, they will only be able to see their project. They'll only be able to see their workloads. They'll only be able to see Prometheus and Grafana statistics for their project. They won't even know that anybody else is on the cluster. It looks like it just belongs to them. Now, if they started to get 
you combine this with pod security policies or um, uh, open policy agent, which we're starting to roll out because nobody really uses PSPs. So OPA policies or PSPs to, to limit what pods are actually allowed to do and, and what privileges they're allowed to have when they run, then you can start to really, really lock down the cluster and make sure that people can't escape to do other things. But if you really, like, if you really, really, if you're a bank, just build a second cluster because you can afford it. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned a few things here that I think uh, maybe just talk about for a second. Calico, Flannel, these mm -hmm. are all network plugins. Uh, and and this is actually kind of across the board with a lot of different uh, things inside Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes has made an extensible, uh, like, so the network layer is, is extensible. You bring your own network layer uh, with you if you want. You can switch it out, uh, something called the, the CNI, right? Um, mm -hmm. can, can you talk maybe a little bit more uh, about that feature of Kubernetes and, and, and why it's important and, you know, uh, why would I pick Calico over, uh, <laughs> I think mean, you gave us a good reason, but for somebody who doesn't. Yeah. Kubernetes isn't Kubernetes isn't going to tell you how to do things. It 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 wants to be as flexible as possible and as modular as possible to let you construct the environment that you need for your use case. So if you, for example, have a BGP infrastructure and you want to, you know, if you understand BGP fabric and you want to do more in that regard with routing stuff, you know, you start doing things with like AnyCast or whatever, Calico might be a better fit for you. Or you could use Canal, or you could use Flannel. Or if you wanted Windows, for example, uh, you'd need, it's only supported with Flannel. So it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's almost like a one size fits everyone. And, and then there's a whole ecosystem of third party stuff. If I show you the CNCF landscape slide, this is crazy. Here is just the CNCF ecosystem of third party stuff. Not all of this is for Kubernetes, but a lot of it. So, so there's, there's this paralysis by analysis thing. It even goes off the screen down here. Oh yeah. So this is just overwhelming. So there's Rancher. Rancher also wants to be flexible and modular and let you choose what you need, but it also gives you a sane set of defaults. So if you just want to get in there and just start doing stuff, you can. But if you want to, if you know you need Kubernetes clusters built to a certain specification or they need to be air gapped or, or whatever, then you can build those. We have instructions on how to build them and then import them into Rancher for secure management of them. As far as why, like outs, those are the reasons why I think it's important that Kubernetes plays nice with everyone is to make it fit the broadest number of use cases so it can be super inclusive. You guys have a, other business -y thoughts around it though? What do you think, Andrew? Um, yeah, so this kind of touches upon a point that I kind of brought up earlier where, you know, when you think about the depth of the Kubernetes, um, you basically get what Adrian just showed on screen. Um, but to, uh, but to expand on kind of what another point he made earlier is, you know, everyone's Kubernetes environment is going to be different because the benefit of Kubernetes is you can cater it towards exactly what you need, right? Um, so I don't know if I have a good answer, um, but I think those two points are extremely important for folks that are looking to migrate over to Kubernetes or use Kubernetes is you're supposed to make it for your use case, right? Like there's not a one fits all solution in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, Again, and then when you look at this this wonderful diagram, <laughs> um, yeah. these are the options that you can customize to your setting. And so, like, I think a good way to look at Kubernetes is like it's kind of like having a hundred knobs, and then each turn of the knob will give you a different output or a different result. And so, it's a matter of finding the right combination of knobs to get your desired outcome. And I think that's typically the best mm -hmm. way to look at Kubernetes. And again, looking at this diagram, you have all the options, <laughs> right? So, yeah, that's uh, that's my thought. Let's talk about options. So we're at the global level here. Actually, let's jump back into a cluster. Rancher's not just about deploying workloads and like you'll spend a
deploying. We didn't talk about ingress controllers, but there are layer seven load balancer that you can put in uh, your Kubernetes cluster to do more intelligent load balancing versus just the straight layer four load balancing that a service gives you. There are storage classes and storage drivers that allow you to plug Kubernetes into EBS volumes, for example, or you could use NFS drivers to talk to EFS, or there's you can talk to pretty much any storage provider that exists, um, even going so far as to if you need shared storage across your cluster, you could, for example, install an NFS server inside of the Kubernetes cluster that's backed by an EBS volume and then exposes NFS services inside the cluster. So now you can have your website content in one location, but have it mounted on multiple pods spread across the infrastructure. Those kinds of things are possible with volumes. Traditionally, to do these things with Kubernetes is complicated and requires a bunch of that YAML that we, we showed earlier, but doing them in Rancher is, is much easier. Rancher doesn't hide any of the Kubernetes functionality. It just makes it easier. And I like to call it a force multiplier, although maybe you could think of it as a lever. Um, some famous philosopher or mathematician or somebody whose name I don't know said, if you give me a lever, I, a long enough lever, I can move the world. And, and Rancher gives you leverage. It allows you to do more, to do it faster, to do it more reliably, which frees your time to go on vacation or do something else. For example, something that is very popular in the space right now is Istio or service mesh in general. Yes, yes. Service mesh is an advanced Kubernetes topic where there are problems with how communication, well, not problems, there are limits. At, at, at the, the default communication between pods and between nodes is sufficient up to a point, but when you need more advanced things, um, you need another layer of intelligence, and that's what service mesh has come to, to bring. So for example, if you have a pod and it's busy, Kubernetes might still send tons of traffic to it. If it's still answering on a port or it can't intelligently say that it's failing, um, Kubernetes will just slam it, and that can create more, more problems and longer time to recover. Service mesh can do a thing where it'll see increased latency and it'll start to throttle back traffic going to that particular pod um, and flip it off even with a circuit breaker. And then it'll continue to monitor it. And then when it starts to recover, it'll flip it back on again. So it doesn't, it can detect degradations in service and it can do intelligent routing and it adds a whole nother layer of security. Istio is a very popular service mesh and deploying Istio is a multi-stage, multi-phase process. Or with Rancher, you could just come in here and say, enable. Just my cluster is not big enough to do it. And this will install Istio for you. And it will give you all of the Istio configuration, all of the Istio management apps. Let me see if I have an Istio environment out there somewhere. We can go look at really quick. Flash Harry in chat, Flash Harry 82 uh, said that your quote was from Archimedes. Archimedes. I was going to say like Da Vinci or, or <laughs> but yeah, Archimedes. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Math guy. That's important. I think I'd remember that. Not my favorite. Math. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do use algebra. I have not used anything more yeah. advanced than that. I don't use anything from calculus. All right, mm -hmm. this is taking forever to load, so we're not going to do that. All right, so so service mesh, for example, we we it's like hitting the easy button. Deploy it and then get you get you. All right, here. I was at KubeCon a couple of years ago, and we were doing demos off of iPad Pros, and somebody asked me to describe what Rancher does. And I, I put the iPad down and I said, okay, this is, you know, this is the landscape and you're here on one side and you want to get to the other side. But in between is like a swamp with alligators and broken glass and, and bandits. And it's just, it's a, it's a bad neighborhood and you don't want to go through there. Rancher is like a bridge that gets you from, I would really like to do something to I'm able to do something as quickly and painlessly as possible. And you're welcome to go back and slog through the swamp and like, you know, lift up the rocks and see what's going on under there. But you don't have to if you don't want to. So we do those things with service mesh, other advanced Kubernetes topics, horizontal pod auto scaling, setting up rules where it can detect uh, either through, especially if you enable advanced monitoring with Prometheus and Grafana, we can see things like number of requests per second. And if that goes over a certain threshold um, across the entire number of pods or CPU utilization above a certain percent on the pods, add more pods. 
And then this works with with cluster auto scaling, where you can have the the system actually spin up more nodes if it reaches certain thresholds in the cluster itself, and not just spin them up, but also spin them down. And in this case, of course, on a pod auto scaling, spin the pods back down. So you can dynamically change the environment according to the load. And this is something that exists in Kubernetes, but is not that pleasant to set up. But in Rancher, you know, it's easier. You just set up the definition and make it go work. We have an integrated CI CD system. If you don't use anything like Jenkins or Drone or Circle CI, then you can plug this directly into your Git repositories and start to make those changes propagate directly into the cluster. I just looked at the time. I realized it's 6.20 right now. And I should probably change over to show you guys just how easy this is to install, how easy K3S is to install, and then see if we can actually get to that cool example that I wanted to do. What do you say? Two things real quick. Uh... One, there's a question. The second thing that I will start with is, we're here. You're here. This <laughs> is Howdy Partner, AWS's uh, chance to let our partners come on and show their products. You're here today with me. I'm AM. I'm a partner solutions architect. We got Andrew all the way down there at the bottom. He's also a partner solution architect. And in the middle of between us, we've got Adrian <laughs> from Rancher. Uh, and he has been giving us one, a crash course, right, for the first hour of the stream in all things Kubernetes, right? I, I think you did a really, uh, really phenomenal well, Most job. things Kubernetes. Some, yeah, some yeah. things Kubernetes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A small portion of this subsection of Kubernetes. But it's a good way to, to, to start to understand the larger ecosystem that exists, I think. And, uh, and we haven't actually had anybody on stream that has given us this, so I really appreciate that. Um, now we've moved into Rancher, the product that, that we're talking about today. Uh, there's multiple things that Rancher does. Right now we're looking at uh, managing clusters, pulling out you know, uh, more advanced workloads. We're about to switch over to K3S, uh, which is another product that Rancher has, uh, has graciously bestowed upon the community. Uh, one of my favorites that Rancher does, just because it's so interesting. Now we have a few questions um, from Tesseract. Um, I'll lead with actually true, uh, true Roca's because, uh, they ask about the CI CD that you were just showing. Does it integrate with code commit or code pipeline or anything, uh, which are AWS services? I think with, with the, the pipeline you're describing, it's, it's just, it's standalone pipeline yep. in and of itself, it, right? It's a, it's, it's. If you already have a CI CD system, then you've, you're not going to use this. It's for people who don't have anything and they don't want to go and deploy Jenkins or, or any other external system. I'm not familiar with CodeCommit or CodePipeline. Sorry. No. Um, no. So this is, this is a, stripped, it's a stripped down version of Jenkins that runs directly inside the cluster. And it's just designed to get you some basic, I push code out there, I run some tests on it, I'd get it deployed in the cluster. So it's to bridge your repo with the cluster. Now, Tesseract's question is uh, pivoting in a different direction. How do you fine tune your resource allocations to deployments over time? Like changing the CPU, uh, yeah. tasks, et cetera. So, so I'm in the process of upgrading my home cluster because it's old and it's been like upgraded and upgraded and upgraded since the beta release of Rancher 2.0, which was like two years ago. Um, it's got a bunch of stuff that's wrong with it. So just last night I sat down and I said, I'm just going to rebuild this whole thing on K3S. And one of the first things that I migrated over was uh, the Unify controller. I have a bunch of Ubiquity equipment, access points and stuff like that. And I have a controller that I run inside of Kubernetes so that it can manage all of that. And the best practice is you, you always want to, to tell Kubernetes what you're pods are using. So you have, you have two things you can set. You can set a, a reservation and a limit. You can set it for CPU and for memory. Reservation is a reservation and a limit is a limit. The reservation is what Kubernetes uses to not oversubscribe nodes. So if, if, if it knows that, you know, what does it say? I have seven gigs available or almost eight gigs of RAM available um, in this particular cluster, which has, I think, one node. So if I have eight gigs of workloads with, if I have workloads with eight gigs of memory reserved, even if they're not all running, it won't let me run new stuff um, because it knows that it needs that space. 
if you don't do that, then it can oversubscribe nodes and it can deploy more things onto nodes because it doesn't keep track of what the resources are actually using. So I deployed the Unify controller and I wasn't sure how much it needed. So I just picked an arbitrary number and I was like, okay, I'll give you a CPU reservation of this and a memory reservation of 256 megs of RAM. And then I ran it back with Kubernetes top. Uh, let's see what we have over here. If you take a pod, say kubectl top, I think it's no, kubectl top pod. Kubectl. I, last night was the first time I used this. So I, I don't remember the syntax. kubectl top I pod. Seen that. Uh, OK, so kubectl top pod. So I don't actually have to tell it what pod. Um, this really get services and keeps OK, so we don't have the metric server running. Um, here, let's, let's do this. I will just point it at my home cluster. Uh, 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 let's see. So here I just CD'd into a directory and I have a kubeconfig local to that directory and I just pointed the kubeconfig environment variable at the local kubeconfig which allows me to run kubectl get nodes, which I always do after changing my kubeconfig to make sure that I'm pointed at the right cluster before I start going off and deleting stuff. And now if I say kubectl top pod, nope, NS infrastructure. So you can't see me using the things I showed you how to do earlier. So we, we've now switching to the infrastructure namespace, which is where I have the unified controller running. And if I say kubectl top, Pond. There you go. Oh, there. So, oh. in uh, this particular oh. 13 milli CPUs and well, there, good, you. Yeah. No, I'm still here. There you go. There you are. You're back. I'm back. You, you time traveled, but the rest of us stayed still. <laughs> I can still hear you guys. All right. You see my screen again? Yes, yeah. Dude, Chile is really far away from places. My sister is, was going to visit. Yeah, my sister was, uh, she was going to take her daughter on like a graduation trip. She was like, yeah, we're going to Cancun. We thought we'd swing by Santiago. And I was like, you need to look at a map. <laughs> 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 it's not swing by. <laughs> she looked at a map and she didn't oh, come visit. Anyway, so there you see kubectl top. So it tells me that this particular pod is using 13 milli CPUs and it's using 484 megs of RAM. So I had set it to 256 and I saw that it was using 255. So I knew that I set it to a limit of 256 and I knew that it was using, I saw it was using 255. So I knew that I needed to raise the limit. So I raised the limit to 512. You could raise the limit to whatever and then just check on it after it's been running for like 24 hours. And that'll give you an idea of what its utilization is and then just go back and adjust it to set, um, to set the right limit. And where you can do that in Rancher is if we were to come to one of our workloads. So here's our deployment. We'll say edit. And if I scroll down here to advanced options and then scroll down to security and host config, you have all sorts of stuff in here about privilege mode and escalation and all these other things. But this is also where you scroll down, you get your reservations and limits. So I would set this if, if this was for the unified controller. Um, I would set this to 512 megs um, CPU reservation, or I could set it to 256 and set a limit of you know, 512. Um, since I know that it's going to be using 400 and something, it's probably better for me to set it to 512. And it's okay to set a reservation and a limit to the same. Or you can set it to a higher number too. So uh, John P asked some questions. Um, I, they're kind of again pivoting away, but you have to answer those because he's your plant, and you, that's right. <laughs> just to be here. Uh, so John P asks. Uh, uh, they ask, does it work well with 
just, just rancher, I assume, is it. Uh, work well with GitHub Actions. That's the first thing. Uh, which I think is kind of separate. Like, those things don't really... Uh, yeah, not, I... They're they're not they're not related. I don't use GitHub Actions. I saw something about it the other day, and I don't actually even remember what it is. So so the easy answer for that is there's no integration between right. Rancher and GitHub Actions. But see, it makes it easy to automate your software workflows. Uh, World class CI/CD. Yeah, it's essentially Look, you, CI/CD. It's a CI/CD system. You can plug any CI/CD system into any Kubernetes cluster by giving it um, a kubectl config file. And and having the ability for you know one part of your pipeline to actually do a kubectl apply, and that's basically it. So you can set secure variables. All CI/CD systems have a way to set secure variables where you would put like API keys and things like that. So you can generate a kubectl config file on the fly from known secure data like an API key, and then use kubectl apply to apply stuff out to a cluster. It's how I used to do it with uh, GitLab's CI. Yeah. Is it? I, I think it's probably fair to say that Rancher is pretty agnostic when it comes to what CI/CD solution. Totally agnostic. Yeah, totally. Is what I figured. And so uh, John P's second question: They ask, does Rancher work with uh, IAM service account RBAC integration? Um, so that, that's like a uh, a uh, ETS. Thing. Ooh. Okay. I got to answer that. <laughs> Let me tell you how this works. Let me school you here. All right, sit down. <laughs> I, I'm seated. I'm ready. Uh, let me. Uh... Rancher, Rancher acts as an authentication proxy. And let's talk about an EKS cluster. If we were to deploy a cluster here and say I wanted to deploy an EKS cluster, it takes about 15 minutes. And so I'm, I'm not going to go through and do it. But you know, we say whatever. We give it the AWS you know, our, our account key, and then it would actually go out with our privileges and start to pull back information from whatever VPC we want to run it in and all that other stuff. Um, the EKS cluster that gets deployed, we can go and generate a kubectl config file for it using um, the, the CLI and the IAM proxy. But what Rancher does when it deploys the cluster is it and this is true of every Kubernetes cluster that it deploys, or even when you import them, it becomes an authentication proxy. So up here, sorry, not up there, on every cluster's top level screen, you've got two things here. Launch kubectl, where we'll actually get a local kubectl shell, yeah, whatever, you know, kubectl, get nodes, or whatever you want. This is great for one-off commands. But then there's also a kubeconfig file, which I'm not going to click on because it'll actually show you my kubeconfig file for, for accessing this particular cluster. You know, this is a Jamie kubeconfig Bean file. did that to me live. Uh, yeah. He was using my, my Kubernetes cluster in EKS. Oh, uh, no. did that to me live. Oh, uh, in Notice JBB I, is not on the show. <laughs> no, 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 he did that to me. I, I immediately, oh, well, I got back at him because I immediately killed the cluster while he was still doing things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's fun. Well, so this this rancher environment in this cluster I built literally today just for this. So there's limited damage you could do to it. Um, but anyway, it shows you this. And for for an EKS cluster or an imported cluster or a custom cluster, what it's actually going to give you is uh, a rancher endpoint. And this is how all of the global authentication stuff works, where you would use that config file with your local kubectl. You would connect to the Rancher server. It handles the authentication component with the backend identity provider. Then it sets impersonation headers in the packets and forwards that to the downstream cluster API. So when your traffic arrives at the downstream cluster API, all of the authentication parts are done. And Kubernetes handles the authorization parts. Are you allowed to do what you're requesting? And if so, then great. For RKE clusters, those are the clusters that, well, specifically for RKE clusters that Rancher launches. So that's down here with the infrastructure provider. Rancher gives you in that kubeconfig file two things. It gives you one, the Rancher endpoint, so it does all of its authentication proxy stuff, but it also gives you what's called an authorized cluster endpoint. And this is the same as if you generated an EKS kubectl config file, and we're talking to EKS directly with the IAM RBAC stuff. Except for an RKE cluster, it allows you to also talk to the cluster directly, but it, Rancher runs a 
It's called Kube API Auth, I think. It's a pod that runs inside of the cluster. And its job is to have a local copy of all of the rancher authorization bits. So if you were to connect directly to the cluster, it still knows who you are with the backend identity provider and handles the authorization bit locally. And the example that we use in the academy and also in our documentation about why this might matter is because Rancher can manage clusters worldwide. Imagine that there's a Rancher server in the United States managing a cluster in Australia. And there's a user in Australia who needs to connect to that cluster. They shouldn't have to send their stuff all the way to the US just to have it go all the way back to Australia. So they can just connect directly to the authorized cluster endpoint. So it's a long way of saying, if you deploy the cluster, even with EKS, you can still use that direct access, or um, you would connect via your, basically wh whoever, whatever IAM policy or IAM credentials were allowed to launch that cluster is who you would be connecting as when you connected here or anybody else that you assigned permissions to talk to that cluster inside of the Rancher API. I don't know if it directly uses the IAM auth proxy thing, but it works exactly the same. Cool. Kang at uh, 15 is asking about uh, support or integration with OpenShift. I think uh, it's kind of our, our parallel uh, platform. Yeah, OpenShift is a PaaS. OpenShift is, uh, well, Red Hat is one of our competitors. Um, right. we, we do, we have, I mean, I don't know why anybody would do this. If you have OpenShift, use OpenShift. And, you know, that's great. Um, we have seen people put OpenShift under Rancher. And when we see people do that is when they have OpenShift clusters and regular Kubernetes clusters, and they want to manage them all from the same place. So it's, it's doable. Uh, and then True Roca, I, I think uh, around the point that you were just, uh, you were just making, uh, does this use assume role um, when, when you're doing the authentication proxy to uh, anything running in AWS? Uh, like. I don't know the details of how it works. Um, I know that we create cloud credentials. And so when when I launch a cluster, you can have multiple cloud credentials up in here. Um, so you know, add cloud credentials, put in my, my key and whatever. And then the cloud credentials are assigned to the cluster when I launch the cluster. And then any further connection through my account to that cluster uses those cloud credentials. Um, when, if AM had an account on the Rancher server and I said he was also allowed to manage, well, we have different levels of access. We have global admins, cluster admins, and project level, well, global cluster and project. So if, if, if I made AM a cluster admin through whatever means, again, I don't know exactly the, the details of it, but through whatever means, he would be able to manage the cluster entirely. Or if I said that he was just allowed to access read-only for a particular project, he would only be limited to that. So I don't know if it's a Zoom role or not. No, so I, I think uh, the, the question here is is around, uh, I, I, seeing this answered it for me uh, in my mind. So Rancher itself, the Rancher server, the UI mm -hmm. that we're now interacting with, could be running anywhere. It doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. run inside Amazon only, right? It could run on your local machine. It could run on prim in a data center and you access sure. this UI. You, you can only use a Zoom role if uh, you know, you're know you essentially running in an AWS environment. Um, so uh, that cloud credential thing that you just clicked on is where you drop in uh, access key and secret key. Uh, and these are credentials that you generate uh, that, that aren't a role, right? So it's an actual user that you're generating. It's mm -hmm. just a program, programmatic user that you're generating. I don't know about Rancher support. There might be support actually if you are running in an AWS uh, account for doing a, a Zoom role instead of uh, uh, access key, secret key access. I'm not sure about that. Um, the nodes themselves have policies that allow them to do stuff. That's just a Kubernetes thing. So that's how they start load balancers and stuff like that. As far as the actual RBAC accessing the cluster bits, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, actually, um, I was actually working with a customer about a month ago. And so they were trying to migrate off, uh, if you're familiar with Kube to IAM, where you install like a proxy cluster um, mm -hmm. onto your. So, AWS actually has a native integration, native OIDC integration. And so like mm -hmm. the 
a pretty common example is you need your pod to be able to put something in the S3 bucket. But that pod mm -hmm. needs the right permissions to actually put it in the S3 bucket. So what mm -hmm. you could do is you could actually just use something like STS to allow your pod to assume the role to then do the thing it needs to do with S3. Um, that's some of the more common examples I've seen in other customers. Um, so does Rancher have that type of support? Where instead of actually having to drop your credentials, you just use STS? That I've not seen. I don't believe we have that in the product. Okay, for sure. But yeah, so not not being familiar with the details of, of how that works from the AWS perspective, um, there's definitely nothing, there's no configuration for that anywhere in the product itself. Uh, but if that is something that's in the Kubernetes layer, then it would just be a Kubernetes configuration and it would just still work. It should oh, sound like if you, say that, if you say that your pod can be configured to use STS directly, then it sounds like it's actually more Kubernetes than Rancher. It might be. Um, I also want to throw out, I think John P. actually is a plant because I think he just, <laughs> maybe he's like looking back and he already knows exactly like what we're going to talk about. So he's from the future. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading the chat and I'm just like, yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> but yeah. It's I funny. So, so this also came up in, in chat as well, uh, the, the idea of, of this UI, right? Um, Tesseract uh, was asking um, the actual UI, and I'll let you answer this, Adrian, um, but is this running on rancher.com like a SaaS? Do I go log in and, and get a dashboard on your service, or am no. I running the UI myself and, and managing that uh, however I see fit? Who, who asked that question? Uh, Tesseract. He's, Tesseract he, is John P's other login. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can vouch for Tesseract. Uh, they're, they're on the stream a lot. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I've interacted, talked with Tesseract a bunch. So, uh, Let's, uh, I'll vouch we for get, Tesseract. We, 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 have, we have like 18 minutes. Let's see how fast I can make this happen. Uh, and I will demonstrate it is not a SaaS. It is super, super, super simple to get this up and running. Uh, so let's see, that was demo one, and this will be demo two. I have, okay, so we're gonna install K3S onto a single server, and then we're gonna deploy Rancher into it. And then we actually, because we're short on time, I'll do that one just with Docker, and we'll do a K3S cluster that I'll kick off here and we'll import that into Rancher. And then I'll show you that these are just running on EC2 nodes um, that I spun up earlier. So I have, there is a really cool, um, so K3S is super easy to install, um, but Alex Ellis, the guy who's behind Inlets and OpenFast, um, super, super nice guy. He built a tool called Ketchup that does K3S installations over SSH. So if I run, Catch up, install. Uh, let's. This is from building it at my house last night. Um, oh, actually, hang on, let me get my. Which one is this? Host node one dash node two. All right, so actually just because of time. So this this right here will SSH in, I have to tell my key. So this is the SSH key for those particular nodes. I'm running Ubuntu 18. Um, I don't actually want to start a cluster. And by default, this will spin up traffic. Um, yeah, since we don't have time, I was going to not install that, and I was going to install Nginx. I was going to do all this other stuff, but, but, so you can tell it no extras, and it'll just it'll disable the installation traffic. You can install the Nginx ingress controller instead. But so this right here, catch up install IP SSH key if it's not your default one, and user is Ubuntu, and this will go out and install that one. Oh, that's really and cool. Yeah, it, it literally takes less than a minute and it'll spit wow. back a, a kube config file. And so that's just what it spat back. It also saved it locally. So if we point that and we say kubectl get nodes, 
then you see that we have a boom. We have a, a single node K3S cluster up and running. Now, if I wanted to add two more nodes to that, node 2 B is this guy. Now, I'm not doing this in HA. I could also do it in HA. It takes a little bit longer, and again, we're, we're running out of time. Um, but if I say catch up, join, um, is that, yeah. I don't remember the full syntax, so I have to use my history here. Uh, that was 172, 31, 31, 35. And we are going to there. All right. So join the IP of the host we're SSHing into. And then we tell it where the server is. And it will actually, I'm not 100% sure about this. This is the AWS different IPs thing. Let's actually put this on the external IP just because I know that'll work. Um, that one was. and my SSH key. Join server user, server IP, users Ubuntu, and the SSH key. And this Okay. So now if I run kubectl get nodes we have a two node cluster. The second node should be up in just a second. Yeah, there you go. And so we have a master and a worker. And if we had a third node to that, Well, there's something wrong with my third node. Okay, so we get a two-node cluster. Now the rancher server As you can see, I literally just launched these right before the stream started. Okay, this has nothing on it. Rancher gives a uh, we have a cool uh, I don't have it in my in my history. We have a cool um, script for installing the upstream version of Docker in in, in you know, on whatever operating system you're running on. Um, let me get that though. Docs installing Docker. I'm in another window, so don't think that I'm typing and you're not seeing it. So this script is in our documentation, and it just runs curl, and you can tell it what version of Docker you want it to pull down, and it'll always pull down the latest patch release. Let's actually run 1903. And so it knows it's on Ubuntu, it'll do the whole thing. And this is the best way to get upstream Docker. So you don't have to worry about like you know, weird Ubuntu extensions or what Red Hat and CentOS do to it. Like this is upstream Docker. And for RKE, that's that's all we need. Once, so Thrax, uh, by the way, Adrian asked why the role is uh, none for the workers. Is is there any other role than master? That's That's a Kubernetes thing. Yeah. Kubernetes doesn't show workers as workers. It shows that they're either masters or that they're none. All right, so we have Docker. Now, there's a couple of ways you can install Rancher. You can install Rancher into a Kubernetes cluster. Um, 
for support. And so Rancher does have enterprise subscriptions where you can get access to support and stuff. It doesn't change the product. The product is exactly the same. It just gives you access to engineering resources and help, um, which some people need. Like enterprises definitely want to, when they have complex money making things running on Kubernetes, they want to be able to call people for Kubernetes support. Um, so you can install a new Kubernetes cluster. And for supported configuration, that's going to either be a K3S cluster or an RKE cluster. You can install it into other Kubernetes distributions, but because we don't control what they do, if you installed it into EKS, for example, and Amazon changed something that caused Rancher to not work, we can't control that. So it's not supported. Your mileage may vary, you know, whatever. Do what you're going to do. Um, so those clusters can be HA, in which case Rancher is also HA. When Rancher is installed into RKE, it uses etcd for its data store. So if the RKE cluster is HA, Rancher is HA. Same thing with K3S. Uh, if you install it into a single node cluster, obviously it's single node. Um, but if K3S is HA, which it does differently than with etcd, then Rancher is also HA. For a development or lab or demo or training environment, you can just run it as a Docker container, and it it's like a wrapper around a little OneNode K3S installation. So that's what we're going to do right now. So Docker run, blah, blah, blah. I like to bind mount a volume for the persistent storage so that I don't have to deal with trying to back up Docker volumes. And this will zip its way down and install. And then in the space of about 30 seconds, we'll have a new Rancher server that I will go to. And then we'll import that K3S cluster. And we're not going to have time to do the cool vault thing that I wanted to do. But I can answer lots of other questions. The vault thing, you're going to have to wait, oh, streaming audience, because I just did it for my home cluster, and I recorded it. And I also have a YouTube channel, so although the content is out of date because I spent the last four months building the academy, um, but you can get that at adrian.goins.tv, or just search for me and you'll find me. I, I stand out in the crowd. And I will have that up there as, uh, you know, how to, because doing dynamic AWS credential configuration with Vault, have you guys done this, Anne or Andrew? No, this uh, is I've amazing. Not. It's for what I do where I'm doing demos and things like that, it's or recording videos or whatever to avoid the JVB issue that, that you had earlier. Um, right. I have a, an IAM account that has administrative level privileges and Vault is bound to that. And then I can just do AWS or a Vault read, you know, and then I pass it the, the Vault path and it reaches out to AWS, generates an IAM user uh, secret key and access key that has a four hour duration or less and then returns that oh. to me. So I can just use that in the video, and four hours from now, the video comes out in two days, the key's gone. Um, you can renew the leases, or you can manually expire them, and my actual real credentials never show up anywhere. That's pretty cool. It's pretty dope. All right, so we have a Rancher server. Um, if I jump back over to a browser, and if we get a new tab, and if I go to rancher 02productionwebsitecom There we go. By default, it comes up with self-signed cert. That's fine. You can uh, bring your own. You can wire it up with Let's Encrypt. You can, there's a bunch of different ways you can get certificates into it. First thing it asks is set a new password. And then it's going to ask you for the server URL. This is what downstream clusters will reach back into. So this has to be publicly accessible. This is why I can't run Rancher like on my laptop at home and launch clusters out in AWS. So that's that. And now we have no clusters. Let me make this a little bit bigger. There you go. So we'll just say add cluster, import. I'm burning through this because we only got a couple minutes left. Um, call this demo02. Create. And now there, you get a couple different commands here. There's a kubectl apply command, but if your rancher server is using self-signed certs, which ours is, then there's a curl command down here because kubectl won't connect to uh, endpoints with self-signed certificates. So we're demo zero two. So if I just run that, this will install the rancher agent into our K3S cluster. 
So it's going to create some cluster roles and namespace and service accounts and the daemon set for the agent and the node agent. If we jump back over to the browser and say done, then in just a moment, it'll take about a minute, this will show up and we can start deploying stuff into it. So you see it's already talking to it. And in fact, it sees two nodes. It's going to go active literally in, in a second. <laughs> um, so while we wait for that, do we have a couple other questions? No, too late. Missed it. Oh. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. It's that fast. It's literally that fast. Let me let me just really quick just show a deployment. And you'll what see, you know, the, I started what this. What does the rancher agent do in the cluster? Um, this is covered in the academy. Okay. The, the rancher agent reaches back to demo. Uh, put it in default, reaches back to the rancher server and does the things that the rancher server asks it to do. So it's responsible for, uh, you know, deploying things and handling, you know, the RBAC stuff and, and so on and so forth. The node agent runs on, there's one cluster agent uh, per cluster. Um, then there's a node agent that's one per node, and that's responsible for doing node level stuff. So handling Kubernetes upgrades and and node level issues. And the node agents can actually act as a backup for the cluster agent. If the cluster agent is down for whatever reason, then the node agents take over that responsibility. Cow color yellow. And we're going to launch this. Now we did not cover ingresses. So this is up. If we come over here to load balancing and I say add an ingress, this is the layer seven load balancing functionality, um, which is handled by a thing called an ingress controller. If you come to my class tomorrow, we'll talk about this in greater detail. Uh, we're gonna send this to the rancher demo workload, 8080, actually let's delete that and let's create a service. Uh, tell it to go to a service. The service has already been created. And we'll say save. Now that's up and running. And whoops, that's totally not what I meant to do. But I want to generate a host name. No, I want to specify a host name. And I want this host name to be demo.d2.productionwebsite.com, which I wildcarded earlier. And hopefully, if the demon of demonstration does not rear his ugly head, we should be able to go to demo.d2.productionwebsite.com and maybe oh, oh come on it is it doesn't, it doesn't look good i don't think it's going to work i probably didn't open up some port or something all right what do we have for questions well let's see if i can figure out how to make this work really quick Uh, yeah, Tesseract is, uh, is, is taking on the homework to uh, connect uh, their Raspberry Pi K3S cluster to, to the Rancher uh, server now. So Nice. Oh, I guess I have a question. Um, does Rancher also support the Fargate option for EKS? No, we do not at the moment support Fargate. That's something that I know is is a request from the community and sure. we build what the community wants. So that's the kind of thing where if you go to the Rancher GitHub repo and that's a feature that you want to see, look for an issue that's open that requests it and add your support to it. And if there's not an issue there, open one and add, you know, your support to it and then share it with your people come back and like, you know, plus one it. 100%. I did this work should have worked. Are there other questions? Uh, oh, go ahead, I'm, Andrew. I'm sorry. Uh, I think Tesla has another one. Uh, do you all look at K3 as a potential replacement for RT deployments, or are there or are the use cases distinct? <sighs> I can't speak to the roadmap of the organization. Um, it looks like I didn't configure my load balancer correctly, so sorry. Uh, I can't speak to the roadmap of the organization. I know that K3S is hugely popular, but RKE is also hugely popular, and we have a large 
RKE deployment. It's, I, I don't think that they're ever going to, like me personally, I've not heard anything about RKE being replaced by K3S, but K3S is under active development, RKE is under active development, and I, I foresee both of them being around for a long time. That's fair. Cool. Um, so, uh, so a misconfiguration in your, uh, in your probably, level. yeah, probably. I mean, if it, I don't know if you guys have a hard stop, I can go fix it and we can make this work, but really all I was going to show is just that it, that it worked. You got the deployment part. We deployed a K3S cluster, a three node K3S cluster and, and a rancher server. And we imported the K3S cluster in and, uh, and something that's actually really cool about this only works if you import a K3S cluster. Rancher recognizes that it's K3S and actually allows you to, to manage the K3S cluster with upgrades. So for example, you know, if we wanted to update the K3S cluster to 1.17.5, uh, well, we could do that now from within Rancher. We don't have to go out and talk to the K3S cluster directly again. That's just a little special K3S tweak. That's pretty cool. It's it's fast. You run it yourself. You can run it anywhere. It's it's super easy. It's super powerful. Like I spent today building that EKS cluster, and and I told you guys like I haven't built an EKS cluster from scratch in a long time. And it, it took me a while to like go back through the documentation and remember how to do it because I I just am used to you know, coming out here and saying add cluster, you know, pick EKS, give it my credentials, and go away for fifteen minutes and come back, and I've got a cluster. Right. It's there. It's just there. Yeah. And that's that's how I see Kubernetes. But that's how I imagine it's going to be. Like it's Kubernetes is a commodity. I flip the light switch on in my house, and the lights come on usually. And I don't really care where the electricity came from. Although I do have a huge solar installation, but that's another story. Um, I just want the lights to come on. <laughs> like I don't care where my Kubernetes comes from. I just want to use it to to make my life better. And that's what Rancher makes it possible to do. We had two questions come in. Flash Harry uh, eighty two wants to know why why did you all call it K three S? Darren <laughs> Shepard is our our great wizard of dreaming up cool things. And if you take Kubernetes, it's abbreviated as K eight S, which is comes from the internationalization format, where it's like it's K eight characters and S, so it just and people say Kates. Well. If you take Kates and if it's K-A-T-E-S and you shorten that, it becomes K-3-S. So the joke was K-3-S is five less than Kates or something. <laughs> it's just, it's just nerd, it's nerd humor. That's it. Uh, oh, man. It's a long way to go for a joke, but I, I appreciate it. I really do. You know, <laughs> but, dude, if you've run any other Kubernetes anywhere, like I, if given the choice between running RKE or running K3S, I run K3S, not just because yeah. it's easier to stand up and stuff. It's wickedly fast. fast. Yeah. It's so much faster than everything because it doesn't have all of that bloat that it's carrying around. It's ridiculously fast. So, on resource constrained hardware, um, like, you know, I'm, I'm running in my house. I've got like some Proxmox nodes and stuff. I don't have a lot of infrastructure here, uh, but it's great. I can just fire up a three node K3S cluster and just get busy with my Kubernetes. It's cool. It's so fast. Uh, Poe Noobs 45 wants to know um, about, uh, <laughs> in terms of the great, great name. Uh, in terms of uh, the, I, I believe the rancher server, rancher UI, uh, what if you can't use an external ELB or an LB? Um, what if yeah, you can't use an external ELB or an NLB? Um, well, the only, okay, so let's add more detail to your question, please, but I'll try to answer it, uh, try to answer it. The only time you wouldn't be able to use an ELB or an NLB is if you were not in Amazon, maybe. Um, Kubernetes gives you, so there are options. If you deploy a service or type load balancer, then it's gonna create an ELB for you or an NLB. But in reality, you probably don't want that for every single service that you're running because it's gonna get expensive really fast. So what I do is I put an ingress controller at the edge of my cluster and that handles, it's a layer seven load balancer um, inside of Kubernetes. And then I put a TCP load balancer. So an ELB in TCP mode for AD and 443 in front of that. And then I just send all TCP traffic directly in and the the ingress controller handles routing that via host name or path or 
whatever I want to, to route it by. If you, so, there, so that's one load balancer. Now, if you're not in a place where you can deploy an Amazon load balancer, um, your options are to use whatever load balancer you can deploy, or if you're in an on-prem environment, use uh, either manually configure node port services for your external load balancer, or if you don't have any load balancer at all, um, use Metal LB, and that will assign an IP per service for services of type load balancer, but it requires that you can ARP for things and that you can put multiple addresses on a host. So that's why Metal LB won't work out in a cloud provider like Amazon, because you can't put multiple IPs per host um, and have them dynamically move around. It's, they're, they're trying to do stuff with uh, elastic IPs to make that work, but it's still a work in progress. So your other option is to make your own load balancer. You can put you know, Nginx, HA proxy. You just need something that can do TCP load balancing and send stuff into uh, the ingress controller running on the Kubernetes cluster itself. Did he add more detail? Did I just totally get that wrong by making up an answer? No. Uh, not, no. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, no more no detail. No more detail. Oh. Then I got. Then I got it right. All right. Okay. Got you. Thanks. Security constraints. That's why. Boom. There you go. Mm. Security constraints. Security is security in Kubernetes is interesting. Um, not just from the securing the cluster standpoint, we actually have a whole section in our documentation about hardening Kubernetes and um, in Rancher 2.4, we actually do CIS benchmark scanning from within Rancher. So if you deploy RKE clusters, we can constantly do scans of them. And then we have all of the information here in the docs that show you, I just realized I didn't switch my, my screen. Um, so we have all of the stuff here in the docs that that will show you how to do hardening of your Kubernetes environment, how to how to do remediation on on the issues that it finds. Uh, otherwise, air gap clusters is something where we also have information in the docs. But anytime you open your cluster out to the world, you well, you open your cluster up to the world. So I get it if you can't run an ELB or an NLB, but if you if you need load balancing, you have to run something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know what to say. Cool. Um, yeah, I say we probably got about three minutes left. What, what do you want to leave us with, Adrian? Uh, what, what, what should everybody go do? Ooh, the call to action. Call to action. Yes. Call to action. There if you time. are, yeah, if you are an AWS user, even if it, as small as the free tier, you can fire up a one node K3S cluster on you know, whatever the smallest instance is. Rancher requires a little bit more hardware to run. So you're looking at you know, a couple cores and four gigs of RAM. Um, but K3S, go deploy it and start playing with it. It's, it's, a, it's a joy to play with. If you have access to a little bit more infrastructure, deploy a Rancher server. Um, if you think you might put production workloads on it, I recommend that you deploy it in a one node RKE or K3S cluster, uh, because that way you can expand those to BHA. If you deploy Rancher with the Docker container version like we did here, you can't switch that to an HA format. But if you just want to play with it, go spin it up. You can run it in VirtualBox you know, nodes on your laptop if you want and start playing with it that way. Uh, just go do it, put some stuff on it, you know, take it for a, a test drive, and I think you'll find that it's a lot of fun. You can join the Rancher user Slack. Uh, yeah. I think Am has oh, links yeah. for that. So the Rancher user Slack is our community Slack channel. There are tens of thousands of people registered and thousands of people online at any given moment, uh, all of whom are there to help everybody else succeed. Rancher engineers are there. I'm there as well. We have the Academy channel is also there, but that's for the Academy users. So I hope to see you there too. But as you're playing with Rancher and K3S and anything else, if you need help, come over and ask questions, and you will find people there who can give you a hint. This has been uh, phenomenal, Adrian. Uh, we, we cannot thank you. Yeah, honestly, this has been amazing. Very educational. Um, cool, I'm glad. We have an ask of you. Uh, we, we like to sign <laughs> off. Like, I mean, this, oh, whole stream, this whole stream has been an uh, an enormous ask of you to come in. And, uh, I'm scared. Teach us all. But 
we like to sign off and, and we like to give our guests the option of, of what choice uh, uh, of a phrase to use to sign off. We've got three. Um, okay. We've got happy trails. Uh, we've got y'all come back now, you hear. Uh, <laughs> and giddy up. Uh, giddy up is the last. I think like rancher and howdy partner, the brand is so perfect. It's so perfect. It's so like, perfect. I mean, oh, man. Come on. It was a match made in heaven. So, yeah. Uh, what wow. Do you think? Um, I'm going to go with now. Now, do we just like say it or do you have like a sound bite or, or how does. Uh, usually, do I, do I, just, do I, you just say it. I say it as, as we end the stream. Yeah. But you can say it. I'm gonna too. Go, no. Well, all right. Um, I'm going to go with giddy up because okay. giddy up, giddy up means we're going faster. We're going places. The horse. No, okay, that's, there. that's all I like. I like that. So if this is your first time watching, please follow the channel. Uh, we do all kinds of shows on the AWS Twitch channel. Um, lots of really great shows I could do. Uh, shout outs to a ton of them, but I'm only going to shout out my own channel uh, or my own show. Uh, Howdy partner. You should <laughs> always watch Howdy partner, no matter what. Uh, every Monday, every Wednesday at 2 PM Pacific, uh, we'll have a new partner on each time to discuss their, uh, their product or solution or how they make your life on AWS easier. Uh, I already see an incredible amount of ways that my life got vastly improved through Rancher. So thank you, Adrian. Uh, cool. Andrew, anything to leave us with too? Um, hey, like I mentioned at the start of the stream, this is how I learned Kubernetes. I learned it through K3s. So I would highly recommend everyone do the same. So shout out to Rancher, uh, shout out to Adrian. Um, solid product and great learning material. So oh, and also make sure you sign up for his academy. Um, I think that's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing that we should shout out. So, you know, all good stuff, all good stuff. Thank you.